Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Catapult Your Business with Good Hearted Leadership. This is stories of men and women who do well by doing good. And, you know, we're all surrounded by good hearted leaders. They're, they're everywhere. And part of our intent here is always to have you have an opportunity to talk with other people or listen or hear from other people who've applied what we call principles of good hearted leadership to really make a difference. And they're simple. They're five simple things. But what we find in the heat of the battle, when we're in the middle of firefighting, it's really hard to remind yourself that you want to, you're trying to uh, control fires or eliminate them with fire sprinklers. And the five elements that we have here are, are quite simple. One is a unified vision. Everybody has to know where they're going from the front line to the bottom. The second thing is fearless communication. In so many places I find CEOs who say, hey, we've got an open door policy, and I talk to the front line, and they say, yeah, last time I brought up a problem, somebody told me I was a problem maker. So you, you preclude uh, communication that way. Third, appropriate skills. It amazes me how many times we have people who get five minutes of training, and then we wonder why they're not achieving what we want, and we have expectations that are not realistic given the skills. Meaningful incentives. I'm not talking about money. You know, a little bit of recognition, a chance to be able to make a difference, a contribution, a challenge, are all things that are unique to individuals, and good-hearted leaders are capable of getting that out of them, and then finding necessary resources. I can remember in one place where the place was a mess, there was a big sign on the wall about cleanliness and safety, and I said, why, why does this place look like this? And the guy said, we don't have a broom. That's one resource, but there's lots of them that we could think about. So, having said that, today we're going to have the pleasure of meeting with Mary Ann Amon, who has been a friend of mine for 30 years. She's an, a former attorney, a corporate exec. She's homeschooled her kids. I think she takes more pride in being a mom than anything else. But she's taken all this experience and put it together into a program called How to Create Your Magnificent Life. And today's episode is about talking with her about those years of experience and how she was able to pull them together in such a way to release for people the things that challenge them or that may stop them or mire them. And she uses faith to be able to do that. Now, the point is faith is important in everybody's life and how we manifest that is different for each of us. But the good news is that there is ways in which we can help one another. I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to spend some time with you again. You know, I wish it were in person, but this is the next best thing. So I'm really grateful for that. You know, what I want to do is, is help our audience understand kind of um, where you want to go and why this has become so important to you at this stage in your life and why you've, you've really reached out to people you don't know and who may never know you because you feel like you can make a change in their life. So, so tell us a little bit about where you want to go. Okay, great. Well, where I want to go is, is, is part of my whole mission in life. I, I, I believe that I've got, because I have this past and this history regarding, you know, I've been in law and finances and education and government and ministry, all of those things coming together. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing is, is that people have a hard time um, really moving forward in the life that God has given them. Mm -hmm. they, there's all these built on assumptions as mm -hmm. to um, you know, how to live life, how we're supposed to live life, what we're entitled to, what we're not. And there's a lot of debate and there's a lot of argument, especially in, mm -hmm. in the Christian. Right. There's a lot of argument in the church about it all. And we have all these arguments inside of our head as well. So really what I want help, to help people to do is to really identify what kind of life do they really want to live? What kind of life has God created them for? And how can we get there? Mm. So that's my passion. I've had a lot of obstacles. I've seen a lot of stuff. And I know the assumptions that we carry around with us that build up, that block us and keep us from our true passion our true destiny, where it is that we are meant to go from leading an abundant, magnificent life. So that's what I'm all about. And having seen so many, oh gosh, evils of the world and mm -hmm. seeing mm -hmm. in the corporate sector mm -hmm. and uh, high level government, um, in the church even, mm. uh, I, I can understand completely, and I've been there myself, of how held back people can be in moving forward in the life that they are meant to live. No, that makes a lot of sense. And that, that kind of leads to the next question because I think, based on my experience, you know, if you want to get someplace, you, you first have to know where you are. And, yeah. and I think part of what, what, what I'd like you to share with us is a little bit of your own past and how, how it's kind of ended up being where it is in terms of your pursuit of helping them out. Give us a little insight into that. Well, as it pertains to this, um, 
and where I am about business and mm -hmm. where I am mm -hmm. about um, good-hearted leadership, mm -hmm. as you say. Um, I look back sometimes, I, this memory came up for me recently, and it really spoke to, it helped me to understand why sometimes I've been so confused mm -hmm. about leadership, about profession, about ambition, mm -hmm. money, all those things. And there's a scene that uh, I'm watching my mom and my dad and my grandfather, and there's mm -hmm. a dining room. I must be about 10 or 12 years old. And you know, that's a very impressionable age. Yes, yeah. And Right at 10 to 12 years old, you're really tired taking all the things you've observed up to that point. You're starting to form conclusions mm -hmm. and what's safe and what's not safe, what, what's success and what's not success. So I'm watching them argue with each other in the living room. And my grandfather is calling my dad a name. I won't repeat it. But he's calling my dad a name because of the, the business decisions that my father was making. My father and my grandfather are both entrepreneurs. My dad had a building company with a building contractor, and his whole desire was to uh, build affordable homes for the masses, quality affordable homes. And to do that, he had to keep his prices lower than you, than maybe some of the other contractors in the area. And he made certain business choices that were absolutely out of the realm of my grandfather's mm -hmm. thinking. Mm -hmm. And my grandfather was very wealthy and very successful entrepreneur, always had a lot of money in his pocket. But he was very shrewd, and a lot of times, you know, he had like mm -hmm. pieces up his sleeve, and you just didn't know exactly what he was doing. Right, right. So, in reaction to that, I think my father went the other route, okay. and he became what, like, just so scrupulous and ethical. And for me, I'm looking at that, I'm seeing this either or. Mm. You're either going to be wealthy and unethical, or you're going to be honest. But broke, hmm. and my grand, my dad did go bankrupt a couple of times, and so watching that, and then there was my mother yelling in the mix about how she wanted a steady job. Mm -hmm. She liked that steady income. Being an entrepreneur is not steady income. Yes. It's up, it's down, it's in and out. Yeah. So I'm looking at all that, trying to make a decision about what my life is going to look like. So from there, I actually went and became a teacher because I did have a gift of teaching, and I followed that and became a government worker. And then I went to law school because I thought, you know what, I need a little bit more power, more authority in my life. Mm -hmm. That's the route to prosperity. So I became a, a lawyer, uh, found myself really quite by accident as a prosecuting attorney. And when you, I worked for the highest attorney in the state. And I saw things at that level that most people would never get a chance yeah, to see. Yeah, sure. Some of the cases that we had, we actually brought down a whole police force because of corruption, political mm -hmm. corruption, mm -hmm. cheating on civil service exams, favoritism and all that. So, but I also saw a lot of people abusing their power. And you know, true confession here, all right? I used to get stopped a lot for speeding. And don't you think I would take out my sign that I work for the chief state's attorney's office and put it on the dash of my car so that I could get by? You know, those are little things that would happen, and we were all encouraged to do those kinds of things. But it also made a douche inside of my heart You're as right. far as trying to assess things. Mm -hmm. Then I went into the corporate world and became a corporate attorney. And in that, I actually saw um, a lot of greed because everything was about money and mm -hmm. power. And, you know, fear is something that permeates all these environments and structures. And when that happens, people make decisions that are unhealthy for the organization. They make decisions that are unethical. And I actually had to become a whistleblower. And it was a horrible, horrible experience for me because there was a theft that was going on in our company and I knew about it and it was a secret. So those things were very instrumental to me questioning, can we really have, do business in this world and keep our ethics strong and do good hearted things? Can we have the mindset to be honest and people oriented and still succeed? I didn't know. It didn't seem so. So I got out. 
I totally got out. I went into business for myself. We had a, com, a financial, actually financial advisor consultant for um, small businesses. And then eventually I got that all together, right? And I just, I just went into uh, homeschooling, into ministry. But you know what? I saw similar things in the church. Right, right. So wherever there is our people in leadership, <laughs> we all have these choices to make. Yes, no, and, and, and the truth is, Marianne, in those choices, sometimes we're going to make good ones and sometimes we're going to make bad ones. And, you know, so part of our conversation here, I think we've all lost our way somewhere along the line. The question isn't whether you lose your way. The question is, can you find your way back? Because we do have a purpose and I think that's it. And I, you know, what I want to get to next, because you've, you've kind of alluded to it and, and through the course of your history, you know, there were a lot of obstacles created for you. Some of them generated by well-intended people, including your father and mother and some others. What we want to talk about here, and I think what you're trying to do, is how, how do you help people rise above that? You know, how do we identify the obstacles and then um, s uh, segregate them in some way so they don't affect our future? Thank you. That's a great question. Well, you know, for a long time when I was trying to help people, I was really it was very abstract and very ad hoc was all over the place. And it's really been in the last few years that all of that has kind of come into a system. And so the system that I have is about creating your magnificent life. And what I've done is I've, I've assessed through all these experiences, what makes up a magnificent life? And I believe that every person has got that inside of them. Mm -hmm. There's a mm -hmm. core sure. desire right. to have a magnificent life. So would it be all right if I gave you my five elements of a magnificent life? Oh, absolutely, life? absolutely. Okay. Well, first of all, um, for me, the most important thing in having a magnificent life is that it's having a vibrant relationship with God. And I believe God is magnificent, God is for us, and when we have a strong connection to God, we are tapped into the wisdom of the universe. Mm. We are tapped into the resources that are totally available to us. We have a comfort. So having a strong relationship with God is key. So that would be my first core element. The second core element is really having a magnificent relationship with yourself. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of people that really don't know who they are and what they know about themselves they don't like. Right, right. And they, they yeah. focus a oh, lot yeah. on their flaws, their failings, you know, what's not right about them rather than what is right mm. about them. So what I help people to do is really to key in on their characteristics and qualities that are strong, that are good, that are right, that are of God, and have them to focus in on that. We spend time on that. And you do something too. You, I know you have some assessments where you help people get to know themselves through some of those assessments, don't you? No, no, absolutely. You know, we happen to use a disc because we find that if the more you understand yourself, the more likely you'll be able to undo some of the damage that was unwittingly done by other people in your life. And you can't do that unless you know where you are. You know, and so the obstacle is that that mindset, which is it's it's not real. It's you know, fear is uh, you've heard that old acronym, uh, false evidence appearing real, and but we we live our lives that way many times. Yeah, and I think a lot of times too that this where we are blocked the most is how we feel and what we think and believe about ourselves. Absolutely, yeah. No, we so, like to call them belief traps, mind traps, and action traps. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, it's good. It's very good. I like that. So the third thing is, um, it has to do with magnificent relationships. If we don't have great quality, healthy, oh, growing, fulfilling relationships, we are lost. We just feel so isolated, so alone. Relationships with ourselves, with others, with the world is what really gives us a lot of our purpose, right? Yes, no, absolutely. So, so we work on that too, core relationships. Um, the fourth thing is your magnificent work. Um, there's a passage I love in Ephesians, and it says that we are created, that we are God's magnificent masterpiece, masterpiece, and we are created to do good, good work, which I believe can all be sucked into a good work that God prepared in advance for us to do. Mm -hmm. And if we haven't been able to identify that good work, and that good work for those of us who are entrepreneurs, we want that good work to flow who our business is right. and out into the world. So we can be problem solvers in the world. We can be contributors, right? Right. So the fourth element then is to have a core good work, magnificent work. Has sense of, it has a sense of nobility to mm -hmm. it, I want yes. to say. Yes, yeah. 
a noble purpose. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the fourth one. And the fifth element is you have to be able to be a, um, let's say, a magnificent uh, manifester. Uh, you have to be able to tap in and be really good at tapping into your resources, whether those are human resources or their financial resources, opportunity, you know, the right people, the right time at the right place, having everything you need to fulfill this good work in your life. So when those five elements are in place, then people are operating in a very happy, fulfilling, satisfying life. But as you know, as you just mentioned before, belief traps, they are, there are blocks that we all carry mm, around yes. that cause us a lot of frustration, stress, anxiety, ineffectiveness, and we don't get the results in life that we're looking for. So that's the second part of what I do. Well, and I think what, what makes that meaningful, you know, it's, it's like, I, I'm, I'm, because I work so much in the small business environment, is, it astounds me of how many business owners are stuck in firefighting. And the truth yeah. is, firefighting is exhausting. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's going, running from one fire to another. So when you tell them, let's think about your magnificent purpose, they look at you and go, you must be kidding me. And, you know, my, my description is transaction distraction is what happens. You know, they get so caught up in the moment, the day-to-day -day stuff, which, yes, has to be done. But in doing that, I think you lose sight of your purpose, you lose sight of your magnificence, you lose sight of all those things that make your life hum, sing, and dance. Um, and I, but we all struggle with that in some level. And I, and, and I know from having watched your work, that's one of the things that you try to tap into. It's that joy of seeing how that all happens in your life. So, so the point we were talking about, Marianne, which is really, really important, is that so many entrepreneurs and, other, and those of us get stuck in day-to-day -day transactions and really lose our sense of purpose. And so what I want to do, the next question is, what are the most important things you have to do? And as I understood it for, from your purpose is that you have to get back to that magnificence, that, to, to use a term you used a little earlier, is, is find your compass. Which, which is unique to you. Is that, is that fair, based on your experience, both in business and in the ministry? Absolutely, absolutely. You know, when I think back at some of those examples that I was talking about, you know, people were doing a lot of reacting. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they thought of themselves as a uh, scrapper or a rabble rouser or um, the person that had the biggest yacht on the block. Mm. You know, there was some of that. But without having a strong sense of purpose, without knowing where you're going, then you're all over the map mm -hmm. and you just react out of fear yes. and you don't even realize that. So you know how some of the best companies in that, from that book, Good mm. to Great. Yes, absolutely. Right? Some of the best companies, they know who they are as a company. They know why they exist. They mm -hmm. know where they're going. Yes. And whether you're in business or it's just your life, everybody needs to have a sense of that. Yes. So one of the most important things for me personally, um, because you know, there are, let's face it, when you're in business, there are a lot of things to do, a lot of details to take care of. There are a lot of people who want things from you. They ask you questions on a daily basis. They need your guidance. They need your direction. They want you to participate in this. And then all of that, has, you got the bottom line in mind. So for me, personally, I have to have that time before I even start my day to almost get back every day to look at why am I here? Why am I doing what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. And are the things that I think about, that I believe, and that I'm doing serving that ultimate purpose? Yes. And you know, when I didn't look at it that way, I wasted a lot of time and energy and I was controlled by stress. But now I'm controlled by purpose. I'm controlled by, oh, uh, let's use a squishy word, love. Yes, <laughs> no, no, I, th I, I think. I think that's such a powerful thing that, uh, that we overlook. You know, when I say love, people see, think it's a squishy sort of thing. And, you know, I've often said, you know, is it kumbaya or money in the bank? And basically, people who are well-loved and, and see it and feel it perform at levels that are almost impossible to get out of other people. So I'm in yeah. total accord. Um, you know, I have a client who is, um, he was able to take his company from being way in debt to multi, multi-million dollars every year. And he was able, when I asked him, you know, what is it that um, you could say is the number one thing that has caused that success? And he's a systems person, he's a strategist, 
He is a team player. But on all the things that you could do, he said it's mindset. Mindset is number one. Everything we do flows from our mindset, whether it's good or it's bad. And I've seen this over and over again for all my 62 years. That is exactly what I have come to believe. And I used to think it was everything else. So it's not education, it's not experience, it's not your skills, it's not your strategies, your solutions, all the systems you want to put into place. It's mindset. And mindset will flow into each of those areas. But to do otherwise is to have a cart before the horse. No, I, I agree. And I think what, you know, that, that's a great transition is, yeah. you know, how do you get everyone involved? And I think to your point, the reason I, I, I really wanted to build this thing around good hearted leadership in my mind, that's where it starts. The mindset of good-hearted leadership, the mindset of love first and everything else follows is what really drives better organizations. It improves systems, it improves results, it improves everything because engaged, purposeful people make better decisions than those who are wandering in the wilderness, so to speak. You know? So I think yeah. that's really important. L let me, um, you know, because I, I know you have a limited time. We've got a little bit here. What I want to do is it's the love that gets everybody involved. How do you help people know they're making progress? What do you do to be able to enable them to move forward and to make sure that this is not something elusive and they get back into firefighting? Well, I do a similar thing to you do. I always start with the end in mind. What is it they want to create? What results are they looking for? How do they want their life to look? And so I get a picture of that with them. I can see by even talking to them where their belief and expectancy is around that and where it isn't. And so when we do that, we take that snapshot of where they want to go, and sometimes they don't even know. So what I do is help people even figure that out. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're, sometimes um, the beliefs that are hidden within are so strong uh, and working against them that it even blocks the very vision that they're trying to create and move for. Absolutely, yeah. So, my first um, step with people is always to identify where do they want to go, how clear is that picture. And if that picture isn't so clear, why is that? Mm -hmm. And when I actually take people through a process, um, you've seen it, it's called belief to results. And I start off with their results that they're trying to create in their life, what have they done to uh, get those results to happen, and looking at what those action steps are because everybody says action you need to take action to get the results you're looking for and while that's true there's something called emotions and feelings that most people don't like to talk about that actually affect the very actions yes. that you take right and, so, and go ahead. no to, to your point you know beliefs will move your heart and mind and body in a direction that you either want to go or someplace you didn't intend to go yeah yeah and here's the interesting thing is, when we talk about our feelings and our emotions, um, what brain scientists have discovered is that your thoughts, emotions are just chemical responses in your body, responses to the thoughts you think. So once you're thinking the thought, then it engages that brain system, chemicals flow in your body, creates anxiety or stress or frustration or anger, or it creates mm -hmm. joy or yes. positivity or confidence. So whatever you're thinking will control those emotions, and then those emotions will then control the quality of your actions. And so I take people through that process. Now, the interesting thing is all of that, though, is based on the belief we believe. Yes. Whatever the belief, and that is very, very hidden. Those are things that are so deep into our subconscious. So when I'm working with people, I have to, in, in the workshops that I, I have, or even the conferences, I have to get people into a state, almost, of being able to look, and that's what the process actually does. It helps people to easily identify what are the beliefs that are working for me, and what are the beliefs that are working against me. This is a great place for a segue. I understand you're going to be doing something out here in California. Yeah. Soon. Would I you mind? Here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to explain what you're going to do. Please okay. leave us your website and your phone number because people will be wanting to reach you. So somehow okay. or another, I think it's important for them, if they want to learn more about how you work, where they can get a hold of you, Marianne. Okay, absolutely. 
I'm really excited about this too, Ray. And um, this is going to be the first time actually doing a full day of the Beliefs to Results workshop. I've done the workshop in lots of mini settings. And so what the feedback that I have gotten, I've gotten people just get instant breakthrough. It's just amazing to me, instant breakthrough. And I didn't realize the power of this until I started seeing it happen over and over again. So people started asking me to have a longer session rather than just 90 minutes of the workshop. They wanted like a whole day so that they could actually take some time to break through, process through some of this and find out what is holding them back for whatever results they're creating. So that is going to be in September 27th, it's a Saturday, and from 9 to 2.30, um, and then you're going to do a bonus session with me as well. And so that is going to be the Beliefs to Results Workshop, September 27th. They can go to my website, beliefstoresults.com, get all the details there. Um, we'll be having it in, uh, let's see, in Newport Beach, right across the street from the John Wayne Airport. And um, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's a light way, an enjoyable way, an easy way to approach a very complicated subject. But you should be able to get anybody who comes, I guarantee, will get some kind of breakthrough that's going to move them forward by the end of the day. So Absolutely. Again, if you would, repeat the website. And if, you, yeah. if you're comfortable, give them a phone number if they want to ask more. OK. Uh, the website is belief to results.com, belief to results.com. Uh, they can contact me through email, Marianne at MarianneAmon.com. And do you want me to spell that? Or Please. We have to print it out somewhere. Go ahead, uh, uh, spell it out for their benefit. M A R Y A N N at M A R Y A N N E H M A N N. Dot com. That's my name, Marianne Amen. Uh, so they can send me an email that way. Um, we can also, I can give them my uh, office number and it's 585 406 5726. And one of my team members will get back to them. Cool. Marianne, as, as usual, it's always a joy to talk to you. And this has been illuminating for me, and I've known you a long time. And I'm going to encourage the people who've listened to this to attend your workshop because it's a very modest investment for a huge benefit and I've seen the, the value of your work and you and your husband epitomize my sense of good-hearted leadership which I think is transformative and we need more of that in the world as opposed to less so thank you very much I'm thank going to you. kind of wrap it up here with my uh, with my audience and uh, I want to wish you and the best and give my love to Jean as well I will thanks Ray I appreciate you bye-bye you're welcome and again, as we were mentioning here, what we wanted you to realize is what Mary Ann was talking about, good-hearted leadership, is focused on how do we make these transitions, transformations occur first inside and then outside. And as I said, there are five principles of it that we focus on because we think it's critical. Unifying a vision. Everybody has to be in the same place. Second thing is that people have to have the understanding that they can fearlessly communicate both their strengths, their weaknesses, and their fears. We need to have appropriate skills. How do we train our people so that they feel comfortable with being able to communicate things that are important to making things faster, to make them better, to make them safer, to make them simple? How do you get meaningful incentives? And yes, money is a part of that, but more importantly, make them feel like they're important. As Mary Ann said, it's all about love. It's about giving them the sense that they are important and building on that. And then finally, necessary resources. And many times, that's simply the support of them from you to say, yes, you are valuable, and we're going to try to build your strengths. Again, this has been Ray Anderson with another episode of Catapult Your Business with Good-Hearted Leadership. It's been a real joy. If you want to reach me, I'm, you can call me at 951-634-6714, or you can reach me at my email, ray at andersonbusinesscoaching.com. And that's Anderson with an S-O-N. And again, this has been Ray Anderson, a drop of golden sun. Thank you so much.